Thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak today, the invitation. I'm from McMaster University in Canada. Um, and I am speaking today about low-dose penicillin exposure delivered during the adolescent period to mice and looking at the long-term effects on these animals into adulthood. And I have no disclosures. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, but I am interested in the gut-brain axis, as are many of you I know. Um, probably doesn't need much introduction, but we know that there's both top-down and bottom-up conversation that occurs between the gut and the brain, and that this is mediated through a variety of factors, um, including, or a variety of systems, including the immune system, the endocrine system, and of course there's direct neural conversation via the vagus um, between the gut and the brain. Um, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've become more interested in the role of the bacteria that are housed in the gut. And uh, for those of you that were at uh, John Cryan's Keystone Lecture yesterday, you know that there are many more of them than there are of us. And I will sort of leave it at that because he covered that uh, quite extensively yesterday. When I first began this work, I was um, examining germ-free mice, and uh, so mice that had been born and raised in the complete absence of any kind of bacteria in the gut or otherwise, and published along with a number of the other papers that came out um, around a similar time that germ-free mice had a very particular behavioral phenotype and changes in brain neurochemistry that could be attributed to the fact that they had no exposure to any kind of bacteria through development. And that if you introduced bacteria at various stages throughout the lifespan, it seemed that there were critical windows that you could um, modify some of the behavior and physiology in these animals. But of course, the argument with germ-free is that it has perhaps very little clinical relevance. And um, so interest has moved more in the last, um, more recent years into sort of antibiotic type studies and if we can modify the bacteria and see changes um, in, in the brain and behavior in these animals. So we conducted um, tests. This is a paper that was published this year from our group from a postdoctoral fellow, Sophie Leclerc, who's also at the conference. Um, and she used the model that was developed by Marty Blazer's group where they're using low-dose penicillin V delivered to mice. And they delivered it during the last week of gestation and the first three weeks of postnatal life, so right up to weaning. And then looked long-term at the offspring to see if there were changes. She did a variety of behavioral tests, um, changes, looked at changes in the brain and the gut in these animals. And it was a low-dose, as I say, equivalent to what we would call the pediatric dose of one milligram per day. She also looked at um, animals that were received both the antibiotic, both with and without um, the probiotic lactobacillus rhamnosus JB1. And she found, in brief, that um, the penicillin, the low dose penicillin delivered during that postnatal or perinatal period, had lasting effects on both sexes in the gut microbiota, changes in cytokine expression in the brain, it modified blood brain barrier integrity, changed some of the behaviors like anxiety behavior and social behaviors increased aggression in the male mice, and that concurrent treatment with the probiotic lactobacillus rhamnosus JB1 attenuated some of these biological and behavioral changes but did not disrupt the microbiome. So I'm more interested in adolescence as a critical window. We know that this is probably um, one of the most plastic and vulnerable periods apart from the early postnatal period in, in development in the brain. And we also know that a lot of the challenges in environmental and otherwise that um, the teenager or adolescent is exposed to also affects the gut microbiota. So I was interested to see if this low-dose penicillin V also had a similar effect long-term if it was delivered during the adolescent period. And of course, um, it, definitely in North America, but I suspect worldwide, this is clinically relevant because we often have teenagers that are prescribed long-term um, antibiotic treatments for, for often something like acne. So, but there isn't really much research looking into if there's long-term result um, effects from this. So I did a similar treatment regime as um, Sophie Leclerc <laughs> did where we delivered uh, the low-dose penicillin via in the drinking water, <coughs> excuse me, compared it to control who received just water. Or they received a 12-hour 12 12, 12 on-off of low-dose penicillin V or JB1 probiotic. I looked at both male and female mice, had to have an N of 12 per group. And so it was delivered during the immediately at weaning at three weeks up to six weeks, which is roughly equivalent to adolescence in the mouse. 
And then at beginning at eight weeks of age, the mice went through a variety of behavioral tests, which is adulthood. And I'm going to show just a subset of the behavioral data today, but we did extensive behavioral testing and then killed the animals and collected brains, guts, blood, and fecal samples throughout the study. And that's all under current assessment. So the first, um, these graphs that I'm showing you, this is in the open field. So this is a, behavior, a rodent behavioral test designed to assess general locomotion as well as anxiety-like behaviors. So a more anxious animal will particularly, or that will prefer to spend more time in the periphery of the maze and show, or periphery of the field, spend uh, less time entering into the center, um, show fewer entries and less time. And the males are on the left and the females are on the right. Um, the black is the control, green is antibiotic treated, and the blue received the antibiotic probiotic combination. So as you can see, this is the males here on the left. Um, we didn't see any differences in the number of entries in the males. So they didn't show increased anxiety-like behavior in the open field in any of our, or differences in anxiety-like behavior in the open field in any of our groups. However, the males treated with antibiotic showed fewer, fewer rearing behaviors. So that's sort of a risk assessment, um, exploratory type behavior. And we didn't see that decrease in the antibiotic JB1 co-treated. However, when we looked at the females, we see that both antibiotic and antibiotic JB1 co-treated showed fewer center entries in the open field. So that's a marker of anxiety-like behavior in the mice. Um, and they didn't show the differences in rearing. So just in summary, we see increased anxiety-like behavior in the female mice after low-dose antibiotic treatment, which was not ameliorated with the probiotic feeding. I then looked at the light-dark apparatus. This is similar to the open field, but it has a region of light and dark, and the mouse is free, freely allowed to choose where they spend their time. So a more anxious mouse will spend more time in the dark part of the um, field, we show fewer entries into the light, less time, and so on. It also measures anxiety-like behavior. So and again, the males are on the left, females are on the right. We see that the um, antibiotic-treated males this time show anxiety-like behavior, showing a reduction in the number of entries into the light. Um, and that this was attenuated after co-treatment uh, co with the probiotic JB1. Um, again, rearing, so that sort of exploratory behavior is decreased in these antibiotic-treated mice, just as in uh, the open field, and that was also ameliorated with concurrent JB1 treatment. Um, in the females, however, this time they don't show the anxiety-like behavior in the light-dark apparatus. So this is sort of an important reminder, I think, to behavioral neuroscientists and all of us who interpret <coughs> behavioral neuroscience data that there are sex differences, and sometimes you need to assess a number of different behavioral tests to see, um, to tease apart some of these behaviors. Um, then I'm just going to show briefly our, uh, we did a restraint stress, so the animals are subjected to a half an hour restraint stress and we do um, repeated blood sampling. So we took a blood sampling just prior to the stressor and then immediately after at T30. And again, males on the left, females on the right. And we see with the males that both the antibiotic treated and the control animals show an increase in plasma corticosterone following restraint stress, but this was attenuated with co-treatment with JB1. Um, however, in the females, we see a significant increase in the plasma corticosterone in both the antibiotic and the antibiotic JB1 co-treated animals, um, and that's significantly higher than the control animals after restraint stress. So we see a decreased responsivity in stress in the males after the probiotic treatment, but again, the females don't seem to be um, susceptible to that treatment in the same manner. So in summary, both male and female bulb sea mice show long-term behavioral changes after adolescent treatment with low-dose penicillin V. Um, both the males and the females showed increased anxiety-like behaviors, albeit in separate behavioral tests, which again underlines uh, sort of a reminder to us that we need to be more perhaps extensive, especially when looking at the different sexes. Um, females show increased stress reactivity following an adolescent low-dose penicillin that we didn't observe in the males, but only the males showed an amelioration in both behavior and the stress reactivity after co-feeding with the probiotic JB1. And as I say, this study is currently ongoing. We're looking at the gut and the brains of these animals, um, and that's sort of to come. The implications of this is that we need to consider the potential long-term, a negative long-term effects of antibiotic exposure during critical windows of development. I think we've all been aware over the years and sort of the hesitation to overuse antibiotics <laughs> because of, you know, um, 
because of the bacteria and getting concerned about that, but we also have to look at the host and the effects that this may have on, on human health. Again, males and females may not respond similarly, um, but the partial preventative effects that we see with JB1, the probiotic JB1, is encouraging and could have clinical relevance and deserves further investigation. So I'd just like to thank my student, Sebastian Kay, who did some of the molecular work for the study, and um, the director of our institute, John Bienenstock, as well as my funders, the Canadian Institute of Health Research and the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology.